Over the past couple of weeks, we've started to delve into the subject of the veracity of the Torah. Uh, I think, like I mentioned prior, that the most important question we have to confront as Jews uh, is our perception of the Torah and the accuracy, veracity, veracity and historicity of the Torah to determine if it indeed is the Word of God or if it is the Word of man. And uh, like we've mentioned prior, the ramifications of our conclusions are... Uh, are, are, very, uh, are very vast. As Jews who believe that the Torah is divine, we are governed uh, in our behavior, how we spend the Shabbos, what we do in the mornings, what we're allowed to eat, what we're not allowed to eat, who we're allowed to marry, who we're not allowed to marry, uh, all these myriad of laws in regards to Jewish life, Jewish observance, Jewish customs, land of Israel, all the laws, there's multitudes of laws, and indeed, most of the time, we're actually under the auspices of Jewish law. Now, if it's from God, it's obviously of tantamount importance that we observe the law, that we be aware of the law, that we be fastidious about the law. If it is the word of man, which is the only other option, then we have to take it with a grain of salt. It's a suggestion. Maybe it's a, you know, it's a tradition, but tradition that's not immutable. That's, that's, that's up for us to be... Uh, to question, to reconsider, to amend it. Now, uh, we've brought uh, copious and voluminous evidence to the veracity and historicity and accuracy of the Torah as a divine document. Uh, But there's going to be, very critically, there's going to be a confrontation between ourselves and our perspectives and our attitudes and this reality of the Torah being divine. And if we take the evidence... Seriously, we're bound to be very agitated uh, because when you confront a reality that has ramifications on your life, it's very, in all likelihood, it's going to be very um, mentally stressful. And there's going to be a resistance. Now, the Talmud tells us, a very interesting Talmud in the the Book of Sanhedrin, it tells us, uh, it goes through the history of Jewish people doing idolatry. Now, of course, it's unthinkable. How does a Jew do idolatry? Uh, but the Talmud says, unfortunately, throughout our history, we've had episodes and centuries where the Jewish people weren't always observant of all the laws, and even the most important law, which is to refrain from idolatry. Unfortunately, there were times and there were eras where idolatry was rife amongst the Jewish people. So the Talmud asks... How is it possible that have a nation of the Jewish people, the most rational people, the people of the book, the people who think through everything, to start bowing down to idols? It seems so insane. It's preposterous. Why would the Jews do it? Why would the Jews be caught up with this outlandish idea that some object has power, has ultimate power? So the Talmud says like this, the Jews knew that there was no substance in the idols. They knew it didn't really have any powers. So why did they submit themselves to the idolatry? They only did it to permit themselves to do sexual sins. This is a very interesting idea. The Jewish people wanted to have permissiveness in areas of promiscuity. That's what they wanted. They wanted permissiveness. That was their behavior. The problem is, is if your behavior is in direct opposition to your belief, you're going to be confronted with a problem. You're going to feel like you're, you know, you, you are, uh, you have to justify yourself. How is it possible that I believe one thing and I act in a different manner? If I want to be, you know, have permissiveness with regards to my promiscuity, and then I have the Torah, which is the Word of God. I'm going to feel conflicted. I'm going to feel pain. I'm going to feel guilt. Every time I sin, I'm going to have guilt. So as a way to circumvent that guilt, the Jewish people adopted idolatry, which is a very interesting idea. Let's just sink this, let this sink home. The Jewish people did not believe, indeed, the idolatry on its own merits. They don't look at the merits of idolatry versus belief in one invisible God, weigh the options in a vacuum, see which one was more reasonable, and go with that option. That's not what they did. They had their behavior. And their behavior, right, they had this desire to be a little bit wanton 
in their uh, sexual practices. That's what they wanted to do. That's what they were doing. The only way to justify that was idolatry. So idolatry was a justification for their behavior because it is more painful to behave one way and believe in an alternative life view than it would be to just rationalize and say, oh, idolatry, so many people are doing idolatry. So this is a a critical idea that the Jewish atheism or Jewish idolatry of the time was not based upon rational, reasonable, logical approach, weigh the issues. Rather, it was just a way to permit themselves to behave. Uh, I have a question directly related. Go ahead. Uh, If you look at Shlomo, Yes. Uh, he did have, I, I, I'm not really sure if he actually committed sexual sins, but it probably did because it's supposed to have like 1,000 concubines and yes. 300 wives. So that's one example. And he, was, and he was at the same time worshiping idols. Well, so the Talmud, the Talmud says, the Talmud says about, about Solomon, good point. The Talmud says about Solomon is that he thought that he was able to avoid the influences, the negative influences of his wives, and he was wrong. That's another example, but there's many examples. There's hundreds of examples uh, of people that we know, but there's probably millions of examples of people that we don't know, who did idolatry, but not because they believed in it per se, rather because that was the way of Jesus. So now, in modern psychology, there's a name for this, by the way. In 1957, there was a book called The Cognitive Dissonance, so was it forbidden? Was there some kind of a rule of how many wives can you have? And yes, so there, is, so there is a law, to answer your question, there is a law that says that Akims are not allowed to have too many wives. Okay. Uh, and, well, so the Thomas discussion, is it six, is it 18, is it too many? It's a whole discussion. But either way, Solomon says, because, Solomon said, that because uh, he was able to control himself, he could have as many wives as he wanted. And now, of course, in those times, uh, having wives was strategic. It was a way to build al- al- alliances with different kingdoms. So he had a thousand wives. I don't know if that an exaggeration, but he had a lot. Uh, and that uh, pr- uh, produced problems for him. But either way, yes, 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 yeah. yes, but either way. He also had many horses and much gold, both of which were also forbidden. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. Um, but oh God, how did he keep up with all of them? <laughs> he was a capable man. So um, this is, I think, going to be very, this idea is going to be a little bit agitating. The idea that we, all of us, when I'm including everyone in the room in this reality, we're in, we are very quick to jump to ideological conclusions just because we don't want to face our own behavior. So if someone says, hey, driving on Shabbat is forbidden by Torah law, clearly, well, is it really forbidden? Is it, is it I'm doing my job, I'm doing, I'm, I'm much better than everyone else. But that's just an example of, of us trying to justify when really, like the Torah is very clear about it. The Torah is very clear, you can't do work on Shabbat. Right, but that, but we have a hard time confronting our own behavior, and thus we rationalize. Go ahead. What's the difference between concubine and a wife, really? I mean, from that ancient point of view. It's just as a, a, a central versus a minor wife. But Ed. I was going to say, there's direct parallel between a certain rabbi saying you can tear out the part of the Torah that says man shall not lie with man, and worshiping idols to. Exactly. People want to harmonize. People want to create harmony between their behavior and their beliefs. And if, and if we actually examine it, we realize that we are biased because we, we feel like it's harder for us to change our behavior than it is to change our beliefs. So, so in order to harmonize our behavior and our beliefs, we say, okay, we'll keep the behavior the way it is. It's easier than to have to make tough decisions about that, and we'll change our beliefs. The problem with that is, is that, you know where that brings us to? That could potentially bring us to abandoning everything, to having idolatry. And if you were to ask the Jews, uh, how did this happen? You know, why do you believe in this idolatry? They would say, well, uh, you know, the idolatry makes sense. There's so many people doing it. 
When in reality, what was really happening, I'll get to in a second, Wendy, what was, what was really happening was that they were confronted by this conflict uh, between their behavior or their desired behavior and their beliefs, and they just conveniently said, well, we'll modify our beliefs so that we won't have any conflict. Go ahead, Wendy. What time period are we talking about? Well, we're talking about a whole, uh, the Talmud is, is reflecting upon centuries where, where there was... Uh, there was that behavior existed amongst the Jewish people. So it came and it went? Oh yeah, it went. Time. It went. We're talking about uh, 2,400 years ago. Okay. Between 24 to 2,700 years ago. Okay. So between the 4th and the 7th century uh, of the common era. I want to point out here this, this, this very clearly. <clears throat> I believe that every single word in the Torah is from God. And I believe we have evidence. Tremendous evidence that that's true. Not only that, I believe that the words of the Talmud, the words of the Oral Torah, are also from God. And I believe we have copious evidence to that as well. And we're going through this. This is the fourth or fifth lecture on this topic. Now, the Talmud makes it very clear that there is an imperative to be constantly involved in growth. We can't take time out and say, okay, there's now, this is me time. Like, uh, I'll, I'll leave my religious activities, my obligation to God, so to speak. That's, you know, my nine to five. But then it's me time. The Talmud doesn't believe in that. The Torah doesn't believe in that. We have to be constantly growing. Now, that sounds like, whoa, okay, we have the obligation of doing all the mitzvahs. And now, once you do all the mitzvahs, all that other free time, that white space, that also has to be filled with spiritual. That sounds like a lot to us, right? Let's, let's, let's start from the bottom up. Let's move up the ladder progressively. But I speak to people. I spoke to someone recently. And he said to me, I don't know, I'm, I'm talking to these people and I feel like I'm having, a, I'm having an impact on them, but I don't see any change in their behavior. I don't get it. So I say to him like this, I spoke to him, this is a, a young rabbi who uh, works in outreach in the United States. I said to him, well, let me ask you a question. Do you believe that there is a tremendous prohibition against bitul Torah, against uh, uh, refraining from studying Torah? That means that every second we're obligated to study Torah? He says, yeah. Well, how come you don't behave like that? Well, and the justification begins. The point is, wherever we are on the ladder, we're going to have this cognitive dissonance. We're going to say, I'm good enough. I'm fulfilling my obligations well enough. I don't need to push myself any harder. And this is our Yetzirah Ra's way of telling us, you're good. You don't need to improve. You don't need to change. You're good right where you are. Uh, well, what if there's, this flies in direct conflict with the Torah, with all the Almighty ones? Well, that's not necessarily true. Well, I heard a rabbi who once interpreted it some other way. Right? And that's our way of coping with our conflict. Go ahead, Malka. Growing. I'm not judging you or anyone. Or not me, ex person. I'm not. I'm not judging anyone. But they're what I'll tell you is like this. Old, but they're growing slowly. Yes, which is also a, that could be a way of our coping, right? We could say, "Well, I'm growing slowly, and like hopefully I'll never have to get to a point where I have to change." Some people say, "Like, I'm, well, I'm growing slowly, yeah. so thank God I'm growing, and thus so I'll never slow. have to change." <laughs> right? What's third like this? We have to realize that the words of the Torah are the word of God. And we have evidence, and we're going to continue examining that evidence right now. Thus, when we are behaving in opposition to that, we have to realize that we need to change. And that's wrong. And we can't justify that. There's no justification for that whatsoever. Okay, so we're sinners. Fine, we're all sinners. It's better to be a sinner than to be someone who is delusional. And someone who's trying to tweak reality and say, well, the Torah can be changed. No, the Torah itself says it can't be changed. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, chapter 6, chapter 11, chapter 13. It's very clear. Right? It's better to be a sinner than to be self-delusional. So say I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. You know what? I'm a sinner. My Yetzirah is stronger than me. 
right? But don't try to harmonize. Don't, don't try to change and pervert and distort the Torah to make yourself less tortured. We're tortured. That, that's the reality, right? We, with the Torah demands greatness of us. The greatness is achieved by observance of Torah law. That's what it demands of us. And even once we get the Torah law, the, we don't stop there. We continue and continue pursuing greatness. And, and until, until we're dead, we don't stop working. Moshe, the last day, Moshe, the greatest man that ever lived, he was still plugging away trying to become even greater. That's what's demanded upon us. And there's no respite. There's no respite. Yet when I have respite, right, you start regressing. So what do I do? How do I cope? I say, it's much better to say I'm a sinner and, I'm, and, I, you know, and I hope to not be a sinner tomorrow and, that, and, and, and the next day than to say, well, the Torah really relaxes its attitudes. Um, now, but my point is, is that when we actually confront the evidence head on, it, it will be agitating because it's going to awaken and arouse this dissonance, this disconnect between our beliefs or, or, and, and, or our developed beliefs and our behavior. And that's indeed uh, painful, but we have to realize that it's painful for a reason and it's okay pain because that pain can engender the growth. Right? The conflict and the way we resolve the conflict is going to de- decide whether or not we grow or we just resist the growth and stay in our comfort zone. And indeed, the goal of our, of our deep dive into this subject is to try to get out of our comfort zone and to be discomforted and hopefully use that to, to change and become better people. So I want to examine, once again, the founding of our religion, certainly the way it's told in the Torah, because this, it's very unique a very unique description of a beginning of a religion. Of course, we just had a holiday of Shavuos. Shavuos is the day where it all began, or certainly it reached a crescendo, or the highlight of the experiences that began our nation, certainly starting with the Exodus, culminating, of course, uh, throughout the four, 40 years, but the peak, the acme, would be the experience of Mount Sinai. Now, every, every religion is going to begin, you look at patterns, every religion will begin either with some miracles, some prophecies, or some revelations. Uh, our religion is, and I mentioned this before, I want to kind of really go through this, our religion is the only one that begins with a national revelation, with prophecy of millions, or certainly of, of multitudes, right? Even if it's not millions, multitudes is still very impressive. Now, what's important to note is that despite the fact that the Jewish people had miracles, miracles experienced by millions, and many different kinds of miracles throughout the Exodus period and the, and the ensuing 40 years, we don't look as, at those miracles as being evidence to the veracity of our faith. So, for example, there were 10 miraculous plagues in Egypt. Now, these plagues were experienced by millions of Jews, and by millions of Egyptians. Indeed, there is some evidence in the form of uh, archaeological discoveries, which may or may not, because archaeological discoveries are, are a little bit soft, but may or may not actually show factual evidence in the, ter- in, the, in the form of material remains that do demonstrate that these supernatural events were happening. Of course, we all know the story of the, the, the temp- templates, but these are each miracles <laughs> that are supernatural. They were predicted before by Moshe, they happened, they smote the Egyptians and not the Jews, and they culminated with the death of the firstborn and the Jewish people ushered out in frenzy. These are miracles. However, we don't look to these miracles as saying, this is how a religion started, we saw miracles. Additionally, you know what happened over uh, the 40-year period? So just some highlights. The Jewish people were hungry. What did they eat? They ate manna. Miraculous food descending from heaven every single day for Decades, not just like one time. For decades, a nation of million of millions of people are stranded in the desert and they're eating manna, spiritual food that falls down from heaven. They drink water out of a rock. Millions of people are sustained by water coming out of a rock. Uh, there's piles of meat every morning appearing for the people. Uh, there's a, there's a, a mountain-flattening cloud that envelops the nation. 
during the day, and of course at night there's a pillar of fire. Their clothes grew with them. These are miracles. They were described in the Torah, and, and we know this is the book that we got, and it describes our miracles. Korach rebels. Korach makes a rebellion, of course. Uh, Aaron's staff miraculously sprouts almonds, and there's a fire that consumes the 250 collaborators of Korach. The earth opens up its mouth, and it's the perfectly timed sinkhole that swallows up Korach and his wife and his family and all the people that were there with him, all their possessions. These are miracles one after another. But if you notice, we don't use these to kick off our, uh, our religion, even though these, these baby alone would be enough. But if it was just a miracle, well, other nations have alleged miracles. Right. Ours is greater. The miracles are greater because they happen to millions of people and they happen over a sustained period. But still, we have something even greater than that. We have a revelation. We have prophecy in the form of millions of people experience it. You read what the Torah describes. Millions of people having a face-to-face conversation with God. This is an event unprecedented in human history. And this is so impressive that it dwarfs the description of miracles, even though the miracles happened over the course of decades. No other nation claims that. Every other nation, either they have miracles, but you, those are one-time miracles. You know, one of the miracles of Islam is the fact that Muhammad, who was illiterate, miraculously became illiterate to be able to write the Quran. <laughs> Whew, what an achievement. <laughs> Right? Or maybe someone else wrote it. Or maybe he wasn't illiterate. But that's, that's a miracle. You just look at, just compare the miracles, just the scope of the miracles that kick off our religion and other religions. You know, J.C. walks on water, right? Whoo, whoa, wow. Revives the dead. Whoa, miracles. You know how many people revived the dead in Jewish, in Jewish history? And not only that, these events were not ones that were written 60 years after the events are alleged to have happened. We have documentation, eyewitness accounts. We have contemporary accounts of these events happening. And we don't make a big fuss over it. We don't say, oh, some guy revived the dead or allegedly did that. Oh, he's God. Oh, he's son of God. Oh, he's a prophet. No, we don't do that. We don't get all excited about that. It's common day occurrences. And you know what? If a miracle happens once, maybe it was slay of hand. Maybe there's some trick. We, you know, I, I saw a video of David Copperfield making, this, making the Statue of Liberty disappear. I might not know how it happened, but it doesn't mean anything. It's a miracle. Right? Even if it is a miracle, so what? The conclusions that you reach have to be commensurate to the miracle itself. You know, uh, Elisha revived the dead. Does anyone say Elisha's God, son of God, or any of that nonsense? Even Messiah, prophet, right? He was a prophet, of course. But right, we have to realize that our nation, we have miracles that happen all the time, and we don't make a big deal about it. And then we have miracles that happen over the course of decades that sustained millions of people, and even that is dwarfed by a national revelation. No one, no one else has that. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, why not? If our religion was founded by some society of really wise scholars, how come they were able to conceive of an event that didn't happen and other nations were not able to do that? We're the only clever religion that's able to be founded on a hoax as grand as a national revelation? And no other nation could quite figure that out. We put a patent on it. Is that what happened? We put a patent on it. It says, only we could concoct such a story. Why wouldn't other nations follow suit? Why wouldn't Joseph Smith, who, in my estimation, was a fraud, because he didn't actually get no rolling tablets, and reformed Egyptian doesn't actually exist, and he didn't meet no angels. Right? But if he's a fraud, why, why, why wouldn't he make it up with a lot more pomp? Say that there were millions of people who saw this angel. Why wouldn't you do that? Isn't that more powerful? The answer is you cannot do it. It's an impossibility. It's not possible for me to convince. Maybe I can convince you guys I did a miracle. 
Maybe. Certainly a one-time miracle. I can't convince you guys that you ate manna for 40 years and nothing else and survived. I can't do that. I, there's, no, I don't, I, you know, there's no way for me to do that. The only way that I can get you guys to believe that actually happened is if it actually happened. Sure. Certainly I cannot convince you that you had prophecy if you did not have prophecy. Certainly I cannot convince you you had prophecy alongside millions of your brethren if that didn't actually happen. And that's the secret why other nations don't have that. Because they actually didn't have it. And if they didn't have it, they couldn't concoct it. The only thing they have is, okay, maybe there's a miracle. Had that happened? Good question. Was it slay of hand? Was it witchcraft? Who knows? But either way, we have to really appreciate that the miracles that kick off our religion are on a totally different scale than other religions. Go ahead. Well, uh, I, I hate to play the devil's advocate. Go ahead, play devil's let's advocate. Say this. Let's say this. What could have happened, and I, it, I don't necessarily believe that. I mean, Go I ahead. I believe the divine origin of the Torah. But let's say uh, the actual claim of a uh, million people watching all of this was written down after everybody was dead, so nobody was there to object, okay? They might have uh, written Okay, so, so two responses, later. two responses. Maybe it was written afterwards. Right. Well, let me ask you a question. If it was written afterwards, would anyone have an account of it? Would an event like that be perpetuated? Probably, right? No, no, I mean... Uh, right? It means if people experienced this, they would tell their kids about it, right? And yeah. if they didn't tell their kids, and one didn't. guy showed up and said, oh, I, I have... I happen to remember this event, but no one else seems to remember it. And it happened to your parents and your grandparents. They're like, huh, what? What happened to my parents and grandparents? You know? Can you imagine trying to perpetuate, let's say the Holocaust didn't happen, right? In a better world, right? Holocaust didn't happen. Can I convince millions of people that their grandparents went through the Holocaust? People no, because... Trying to do that. Well, they're trying to do the opposite, right? They're trying to say it never happened. It's, it, yeah. Although we but we have evidence, we have right? But I, but I, what I'll tell you is, is that the amount of evidence we have for the revelation at Sinai is a lot more than we have for the Holocaust. And the chief reason for that is because the Holocaust, of course, was on over five, six years, and. As Shoah historians, they tried to piece it all together working backwards. So they take the stories of every little town and every family and every individual who survived and say, okay, remember all your cousins and all your neighbors and try to piece, piece together what it was because it wasn't all one event. Right. This is an event wherein there's millions of people experience the event simultaneously together. So indeed, there's more evidence to the existence of of the revelation at Sinai than there was to the Holocaust. But it's a good thing to, 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 to ask ourselves. How do we know if we didn't experience the Holocaust, how do we know that it indeed happened? And God forbid, we can never question that it happened. We know it happened. But how do we know, just logically? We know because it was experienced by millions of people and they told it to us. And I was born in 1986. That's 50 years after these events Ceased to happen, at least on that scale. Photographs. Yeah, before the writer has to be doctored. Physical yes, but those can be those to be doctored. I'm, like, I'm playing devil's advocate back to you guys, right? Those those to be doctored, or maybe those are those are the, those are isolated incidents. My point is, is that in, in, events experienced by millions perpetuate. There's a record of it. There's an accounting of it. We learned about it, even if we didn't, right? Each survivor. If knows. if someone showed up and said that there was another Holocaust that happened in 1997. And someone shows up 100 years ago and says, I want to tell everyone about this story, about this episode. You're like, what? We know of the Holocaust of the 1940s. What are you talking about? We have no record of it. Just imagine trying to perpetuate that. You couldn't do it. You couldn't even, you could, can I make up a Holocaust that happened in the 1830s now? Right? I, well, we could talk about the 1748 massacres of the Chmelnitsky, right? Because that we have a record of. Right. But it's, it's, it's outlandish to suggest that someone could show up after the fact and say, I have an account of some event that all your ancestors, in the form of millions of people, experienced. It was the most dramatic and transformational event in all of human history. But no one has an account of it. I'm the only one. And that's the fallacy of J.C. right there. Well, it's that not, happened 60 years after you were. 
Well, that's true. That's, that's one of the fallacies. But, and the fact that there's, there's, there's no natural revelation whatsoever. Right. My point is, is that just work it out. It's not possible. Just like it's not possible that the Holocaust well, would no, be doctored. It's, it's not political and correct. We're supposed to be friends of those Ukrainians. Of who course. Of just because right now Obama likes it. Oh, they had it coming. I agree with you. I agree with you. The people in... Uh, and the same thing goes for Lithuanians, Latvians. Estonians. Absolutely. Once they join NATO, you cannot touch them. And I know you're being facetious. I agree with you. Absolutely. Um, that's number one, to answer your, answer your question, Ilya. But number two, that's also an impossibility because, remember, Moshe gives the Torah scrolls to the Jewish people during his lifetime and during the lifetime of the people themselves who experienced these events. So the story itself contradicts the reality or the, the possibility of this showing up post facto. So besides the fact that it's illogical to actually suggest that that happened, just like it would be crazy to suggest that the Holocaust could be concocted 100 years or 200 years after the fact happened, but the, that would also belie the story itself. So we have an experience, witness, uh, an experience witnessed by millions of people who they themselves received the accounting that they, tra- p- uh, they passed on in the form of the written document and, of course, the accounts that parents tell their children till this very day. Yes? In the Christian story, uh, the, the risen, resurrected, uh, they said, go ahead and touch me. Put your hands in my wound. And looky here, I'm going to eat in front of you. And so, supposedly, that showed that he was not a ghost. He was a resurrected dead man. Okay. Um, and supposedly, so, okay. 500 people saw this. Okay, I don't know okay. who those 500 people were. But okay, but my point is, is, like Dave said, these events are not contemporary. These, or these encounters are not cont- contemporaneous. These are 60 years afterwards. I don't know who these people are. 500 people, unnamed sources, we don't know who they are. Right? I can write, 5,000 people saw something, but no one knows who they are, right? Not only that, even, let's assume it happened, right? I, it, I don't think it did happen. Even if it did happen, let's assume it happened. He was dead, he came back to life. So what? What does that prove? We have episodes of people coming to dead, they were dead and came back to life, and that doesn't change anything, about right? Because that doesn't change the veracity of the Torah, and it doesn't allow us to alter a single word of the Torah. Could Remember, it, even if it's true, which I don't believe it is, but assuming it is true, that doesn't hold a candle compared to the revelations that got our religion started. So to say that an event as minor as one resurrection is going to negate and abrogate a Torah that began with a national revelation of millions is preposterous. And we all heard voice and we didn't hear it again exactly. saying, oh, by the way, I changed my mind. Not well, only that, and this is, I think, go ahead. We had, we had how many people died during the and came back. Oh, they, yeah, they, they died temporarily. That's right. Well, you know, if you look at uh, God appearing on the Mount Sinai to, the, to several million Jewish people and says, well, those are the kosher laws. And then in the New Testament, somebody had a dream that you can eat any kind of snake and that negates what God said just because one crazy That's God right, that's it. right. It's very clear. If that the Torah means... Sense. It's interesting because the other religions don't, don't challenge the veracity of the Torah. What they do is they try to replace it with a different philosophy. And, they even use it and the problem with that is, is that the very Torah itself that they claim once was true makes it very clear that's a final document. There's no amendations to it. So either way, it's not intellectually honest to say the Torah was true, but now it's not true anymore, it's not binding anymore, when the Torah itself makes it very clear that you cannot change it, you cannot improve it, you cannot, you cannot add or, nor subtract from it, it is the final word and cannot be amended. So that doesn't get started. Either way, uh, I want to just, uh, once again, rehash this point. The Torah has describes an event experienced by millions that is as verifiable as the Holocaust is, even more verifiable, uh, and that is indeed the foundation of our religion. We have stuff to back up. If you don't like that, we still have miracles that dwarf other miracles. No other nation has miracles that kick off its religion in any way that rival, that rival in any way descriptions of millions of people eating manna for 40 years. Right? One of, one-time event that may or may not have happened does not hold a candle to that. Uh, and not only that, the author of the book made it clear, was so sure 
that this was the only time this event would happen, that he even wrote in Deuteronomy chapter 4 that this event will not happen again, nor will any other religion claim a national revelation. So, Ilya, you said maybe it was made up after the fact. Even if it was made up after the fact, that would prove that it's possible to be made up. It's possible to be made up. If so, how would you write in the same document that no one else will follow suit and make it up as well? Thus, it's illogical to suggest that it was made up afterwards, and then in the same document it would say that no one else will ever claim such a revelation. The answer is, the reason, why no, the reason why the author was so sure that no one else would ever claim such a revelation is because such a revelation to claim it as a hoax is impossible. And thus, it happened indeed at Mount Sinai, and we could say with confidence, God could say with confidence, it's not going to happen again. Okay, so, I want to I begin... I, I know it's Go ahead. The subject. Well, what convinced me is the Bible codes. Okay, so everyone has, a, if that works for you as well, that's great. Right. But if it's from God, we have to realize what that implies. It's actually still valid today. Because once you accept the fact that the Torah is true, it's still valid today. It cannot be changed. It's valid, Lodorus, Lodorus Sechem, forever. Every mitzvah of the Torah is valid today. Every restriction of the Torah is valid today. And we have to try to harmonize our behavior with our beliefs. Go ahead. Without changing the Torah, can you pick and choose what the mitzvah that you can do or, or the Torah, the Torah, Torah does not give us the option. Speaking. The Torah does not give us the option to select some mitzvahs to observe and some mitzvahs to discard. There's no such clause in the Torah. It's, it doesn't exist anywhere. There's nowhere does it say that you can opt out of some mitzvahs. Yeah. It doesn't. It, 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 that it's non-existent. Now, what some people have decided to do in the face of all the logic and all the evidence, they say, well, the Torah is not true. Okay, but then they have to answer all of the evidence that proves otherwise. But that's the only way you could take the Torah and say, well, it's not relevant today. But remember, once you do that, you have to take the whole thing and throw it out. Everything. Not only that, you have to take the contributions of millions of people and negate and invalidate them. You have to take the sacrifices of millions of people who died for the Torah and make that in vain. Because remember, if people died standing up for their Judaism, resisting the calls for conversion, which happened millions of times over the past thousand years. Not, 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 that's, that's not an exaggeration. Millions of times. If you see the Torah as a farce and a hoax, which you do, by the way, if you validate even one law, you're taking that contribution and you're making it meaningless. And in my view, to kill someone for what they believe is not half as cruel as to make their belief meaningless. To take someone, and certainly to take people of your own kin, of your own, your own, your own brethren, and the, 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 the contributions that they made to Jewish, to, Jew, to Jewish folklore even, and the fact we, talk, we tell our kids about Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva died because he was teaching Torah publicly. And you know what? We're only here today because of the dedication that he had to Torah. He's a hero. But you know what? If the Torah was a farce, and by the way, and I'll repeat this again and again, if you take one word out of the Torah, one mitzvah out of the Torah, and you say that's not from God, everything else is on the cutting board. It's either all or nothing. If you do that, you say Rabbi Kiva died. He was a fool. He should have stopped teaching Torah. Why would you waste your time teaching the word of man and die because you're teaching the word of man? Could you imagine someone going and saying, I'm teaching the seven habits of highly successful people, even if it means I'm going to get killed. That's insane. That's outlandish. That person's death would be meaningless. If you take out one mitzvah of the Torah, you thereby invalidate the entire Torah as being the Word of God. Because if it's the Word of God, you can't pick and choose. 
And thus, you're saying Rabbi Tiva was an absolute fool for doing what he did. And of course, I don't think people realize that, but that is, there's no other way around it. There's no escaping that conclusion. So there's, there's no way. Okay, so what do we do with our behavior? We're sinners, and we need to improve. Better to be a sinner than to be someone who invalidates the entire Torah and along with that, the contributions and the sacrifices of millions of Jews throughout history. Go ahead, Dave. This is a kind of a question that I don't seem to understand. Maybe you can explain it to me. If we, if we believe in the sanctity of the Torah and we also know there was the destruction of the Second Temple, so there's almost... 200 mitzvahs we cannot do, yes. but it's in the Torah. Yes. Does that prove that we're going to have a Mashiach so we can reinstitute those well, mitzvahs? Well, the Rambam, in the end of the Laws of Kings, like the very last two chapters of the Rambam, he tells us about what happens when Mashiach comes. Uh, he looks at verses that explicitly talk about the coming back to Israel and reestablishing sovereignty, uh, hegemony over Israel, right? Reinstituted laws and bring the Jews back to Torah, uh, and thus it's very clear from the Torah itself that the idea of Mashiach, the idea of coming back to Israel, and we see we see we see the evidence already there. Like we see the beginnings of that happening already now with six million Jews living in Israel. But yes, indeed, like like those mitzvahs are as obligatory now. We can fulfill them. Because remember, they're, they're obligatory so long as a temple is in existence. You don't, have a, you don't have a temple, you can't do it. Just like if you're not a king, you can't fulfill the mitzvahs of the king because you're not a king. It doesn't mean that you're rejecting those mitzvahs or negating those mitzvahs. It just means that you are not someone who is capable in your current iteration to fulfill that. But it's still a mitzvah, it's still from God, it's still as valid, it's still, it's still immutable, it's still not up to our decision to decide whether or not we want to observe it or not. It's, it's still valid. It's just not applicable today. So, yeah, so the idea of Mashiach is indeed borne out by the verses in the Torah, uh, and, uh, but, and, and that indeed will be an opportunity for us to fulfill ever more uh, chunks of, 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 of Torah mitzvahs. That's right. Now, I want to quickly, we don't have so much time here, I want to quickly look at some of the things the Torah says and really try to ask ourselves the question, is it possible that a human could have written this before these events happened? Additionally, is it likely that a human would write these words and make these predictions? Because even if it's possible for a human to say some things, most, some of the things, it's, it's, it's outlandish to suggest that a human would write them. But even if it's possible that a human would write them, would someone who is making up a farce and a hoax and perpetuating a non-truth in the form of the writing of the Torah would they be likely to choose to write things that are very unlikely to happen unless God's involved? Because remember, if God is not the author, if a human is the author, and they don't have God collaborating with them, so to speak, they cannot go out on a limb and say events that are highly improbable are going to happen. If I was going to make up a prophecy and it's, I don't have God there to actually substantiate that, I won't say something that's a very, high, very unlikely to happen, right? a very, very high uh, implausibility factor. I'll say something that's very likely. You know, I'll say something like, you know, we're going to have some chaotic weather over the next year. Okay, anytime there's a thunderstorm, pff, wow. Wow, look at this prophecy. I'm not going to say something that's very unlikely to happen. So, when we look at what the Torah says, these are in the Torah, right? These have been in the Torah for as long as we've had Torah. The Torah makes predictions and makes statements and makes mitzvahs that either a human in their right mind couldn't know or couldn't foretell or wouldn't foretell or wouldn't because they want to perpetuate an untruth. So, for example, we're told multiple times that the Torah, indeed it's insinuated that the Torah itself, that the Jewish people will be around forever. Abraham is told, your kids will be around forever. It's very clear. It's in Genesis. You guys read it recently. It's there. You want to look at it? It's Genesis 17. 
I will establish my covenant to me and you and your descendants after you throughout the generations, an eternal covenant to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. We're going to be around forever. Additionally, we're told, this is from Leviticus, even when the people are in their enemy's land, I will not reject them, I won't, I won't spurn them, lest by wiping them out, them out I may void my covenant to them. It's God saying, I have a pact with you. Right? And God's not like the Germans. When God makes a pact, he fulfills it. He doesn't renege on his pact. So God says, I'm, I'm never going to wa- wipe you out, because if I do, I'm going to run afoul of my covenant that I made with Abraham. I will remember them because of the covenant I made with their forefathers, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt under the eyes of the Gentile. That I may be. So the Torah is saying the Jewish people will, will be around forever. Now, for as long as we can remember, we have been around. We're still around today. Right? We're in a Jewish institution right now. There's between 14 and 18 million Jews around. We're still a nation, right? We're still around today. But if you were to go back to the 4th century, the 5th century, the 9th century BCE, and you were going to write the book, the definitive book of the Jewish people, would you be likely to include the clause that the Jewish people are going to be an eternal nation? Would be an an eternal nation? Maybe. Maybe not. It's possible. Remember, you want, as we're here trying to perpetuate a myth, a falsehood, a non-truth, we're writing this Torah. We're so clever. We're so smart. We're going to pass this off as, as the Word of God. And we're going to write that the Jewish people will be around forever. Whew, that sounds good. What do you guys say? All the editors agree? Let's put that in. Okay, put that in. No, they would play it safe. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe they would say, okay, let's, let, 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 let's throw our dice, right? Let, let's, let, let, let's, let, let's just shoot for the stars. Let's say they'll be around forever. Now, we know even at those times, that nations are coming and going like flies. If you look at the annals of history, we have nations that rise to great heights and prominence, and then they disappear, and they're gone, and there's hundreds of such nations and people. Okay, but we're going to run the Jewish people around forever. However, if we are to do that, what conditions need to be at play to make sure that it happens? Well, we should be strong, we should be secure. Mm-hmm. We should be stable. We should have a land. Mm-hmm. We should have moats in the form of culture, in the form of language, in the form of borders. We shouldn't have so many aggressors. Mm-hmm. We shouldn't have so many people that want us dead. Yet all those things aren't true. Not only that, all those things are predicted by the very same people that predicted that we'll be in the eternal nation. Additionally, we're told in the Torah, the very same book that predicts that we will be around forever says we'll always be small in number. There's never going to be a nation of Jews that are billions. Because you know what? If we're billions, of course we'll be around forever. Because anyone we come in contact with would just swallow them up. Not only that, we are foretold, this is in the Torah, that we're going to be wandering. We're going to be from going from place to place. You know what? What happens when you go from place to place? What are the, are the likelihoods of you stay, sticking around forever go up or go down? Drastically go down. So just think about how we're putting ourselves into the corner. Us, the great elders of Zion, the wise people that are making up this farce, this Torah. We put ourselves into a corner by saying we'll be an eternal nation. Jewish people will be an eternal nation. And then we made that, that reality an impossibility or an implausibility, certainly an implausibility, by the rest of the predictions that we made. And we'll go through this next, next week at greater length. But we're predicting in the Torah that we'll be constantly feel the assault of anti-Semitism. So we're, we're told predicting the impossible. Exactly. And why would someone do that? Or yeah. how could that That's be right. predicted? It's, right. exactly. We are predicted that we, uh, the Torah predicts that we will be scattered from our land. We'll come back to the land. By the way, that's happened. It's happened to our nation and no other nation. There's no other nation that has had that. We're told that we'll be on the four corners of the globe. That happened, but we'll stay a nation. We're told we'll be small in number, yet we'll stay a nation. We're told that our very way of living will be under constant assault, yet we'll stay in a total nation. And I want to ask this question. We'll get into this more at greater length next week. 
Yeah, Ask yourself. Go ahead. Let me finish here in a second. Could a human have written this? It seems very unlikely, especially humans with the intelligence to write the rest of the book and to perpetuate the rest of those hoaxes. To write something that doesn't happen, it's unprecedented in human history, to write that will be an eternal nation, yet will be small, will be scattered, will be hated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. they, don't, they don't go together. But what, no. They don't go together at all. Yeah. No. Why would we do this? Just ask yourself that question. If humans wrote this book, explain to me how that happens. I, I can't think of any rational explanation. So we have evidence here. Let's just to go back to where we started here. There is such abundant and bountiful evidence to the veracity of the Torah. It's from God. It's actually from God, and it's still valid today. It's still valid. The Almighty is still talking to us as Jews, giving us mitzvahs, giving us direction, giving us a vision, a destiny as a nation, what our role is, how we're going to contribute to bringing the world back to God, back to sanity, back to sobriety, to bring that day of God into the world. We see tremendous success. If you, t- you were to compare the world, state of the world, freeze frame, the way it is today and the way it was 2,000 years ago, we see dramatic improvement. The vast majority of the world now believes in God, or at least a close idea to the idea of the Jewish God. The Jewish people are back in Israel after 2,000 years of exile. Right? The Jewish people are coming back to Torah after 200 years of rebellion. We see things coming together. But we have to recognize that Torah, there's evidence, and we're going to continue this next week. But we spent five weeks, four weeks now, four or five weeks, I lost track. It's true. It's true, and thus it's valid. And thus, you know what else is valid? Every single verse. We don't say, this verse I like, this verse I discard. Because by doing that, we're discarding the entirety of the Torah. We have to, we have to really recognize that. And this, indeed, like I said, this is going to be very agitating to us. It's very unsettling to know that the Torah is actually the Word of God. Because you know what? That makes our life much more difficult. And we want to avoid situations where our life is more difficult. But just like, I'll tell you, this might be, not be the best of analogies. But if you keep on getting those letters from the IRS, and it's actually from the IRS, it's not one of those hoaxers, those Nigerian yeah. prince guys, yeah. it's agitating, it's frustrating, it's making your life maybe a little bit more difficult, but it's still real. And it's still better for you to respond to that. And it's a bad example because the Torah initially may seem to us like it's the IRS coming, and it's, oh my goodness, I want to just ignore it. But really, it's a better way of life. It's more rewarding. It's more meaningful. It gives us purpose in life. It gives us pleasure of the higher variety, of the spiritual variety, not just the simple ice cream pleasures. So yes, it's difficult. But you know what? The things that are more difficult are the ones that have the greater payout. To love your child is very difficult because they wake you up in the middle of the night and they're absolute brats. But we do because we recognize that the pleasure that we get out of them is greater, and thus it's worth the effort. The Torah demands great <laughs> things out of us, and difficult things out of us, and we think that it's so just all painful. But really, it's not painful. But even if it is painful, it's still true. And you know, we try to avoid it, but we, we come into, in, in, into confrontation with the fact that it's real, it's agitating, but that's okay. Because that agitation can bring to growth. And that growth can bring to transformation. And that transformation can bring the world to the Kulam, and thus to Mashiach that we're all pining for. And it's a better life, it's a more difficult life, but if statistics are very clear that if someone is accustomed to self-control, to resisting, to willpower, the things that the Torah demands of us, they're likely to have better relationships with their spouses and children. They're likely to have lower rates of divorce, certainly lower rates of abuse, lower rates of chemical dependencies. They're likely to have greater incomes. They're likely to have greater levels of happiness in their lives. Because yes, self-control and resistance, those things look difficult to us. But ultimately, in the aggregate, we're better off. 
And like I said, it's going to it's it, it's agitating at first, but we have to realize what the alternative means. The alternative means absolute disaster because it invalidates all of Judaism. And not only that, it's a little bit intellectually disingenuous because you have to run away from the bountiful evidence that proved the veracity of the Torah. Yes, last question. Well, those of you who have seen Fiddler on the Roof may remember that right near the end, they say, we've been waiting for the Messiah for a long time. It would be nice if he came now. And then it just goes on. There's no song. But there was a song in the tryouts out of town. And the song went something like this. When Messiah comes, he will say to us, I apologize that I took so long. He says, uh, in the past, many men said to us, get the Alps, kings they were, gone they are, we're still here. And the reason they took that song out was because the people in the audience, who were mostly not Jews, became obviously very uncomfortable. And that tells me that they know that we've got the truth, and they don't... Yeah, but let's not worry about the Gentiles so much. Let's worry about ourselves. You know, we, we're very easy to... It's very easy to point the finger at other people. Let them figure it out. Let, Even let, they know it. Okay, they know it, but we, ought to, we have to know it. And knowing it, like I said, is going to create conflict, and let's try to use that towards greatness. That's what the Almighty demands of us, and that's what we can do. Let's do it, guys. Let's become great people and great Jews. All the best, guys. We'll see you next week.